You never know what you're going to see down here, but the landscape and the mountain, they're always the same. The only thing that changes is the vegetation, the color. Sometimes it's golf course green, sometimes it's brown like it is now. Hi, I'm Doug Boykin. I work for New Mexico State Forestry for 30 years, and I'm headed down to the Boot Hill and visit with my old friend, uh, Sam Smith. Good morning. Hey, hey, Doug. How you doing, my friend? Great. Good, good to, to see, see you. you. Oh, yeah, it's been a long time. Yeah. Place looks pretty good. It's not bad. Yep. Looking for the rain. Can't wait for the rain. Yep. I haven't, it's been a long time since I've seen this so dry. I'm Sam Smith, a fire manager, range manager for the Diamond Day Ranch. My first prescribed fire, I was six years old. My brother and I uh, did an <laughs> unplanned uh, prescribed burn between our house and the neighbor's house. Um, involved two families. Uh, suppression efforts were successful. And <laughs> just kidding on that. <laughs> and it's the truth, man. We set the desert on fire. My first impression of the Gray Ranch and the Diamond A was after we'd done a fire training at the Animus Fire Department. Jeff Babb had said that we could spend the night here on the ranch. I remember getting up in the morning, going outside to look, and I, I walked out and I saw, wait a minute, this is not what's supposed to be here. Beautiful, and this was, this was in probably 92. Things were wet, green, pretty. Yeah. We started looking at the mountain. We could see fire scars on the mountain. We started talking to landowners. We saw these tremendous expanses of beautiful grasslands. We got 300,000 acres plus or minus of deeded land. We got state trust land that's intermixed, and we got BLM land. And actually, the, the, at the time, a guy named Rex Alford, who was the fire management officer for the BLM, he was with us. And we both just looked at each other and thought, wow, we can do something special here. Good funny story, Doug, I know. Go ahead, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Uh, he was, I guess the fire was on the uh, east side of the road down here in the valley. And uh, Doug came driving along and, and found the landowner uh, wearing shorts and sandals, I believe, and with a box of matches. And he's throwing matches out on the opposite side of the road, trying to get the fire to go on the other <laughs> burn the rest of the valley. And, I guess you had to get out and say, wait a minute, uh, you got to hold on a second. We're working really hard to keep it over here. So, yeah, that's a good one. That was actually told to me secondhand, and the firefighters were very frustrated. And, uh, but it was one of those things that were, it was a learning experience for everybody. The Malpai Borderlands Group started somewhere around 1993. We had a meeting probably with about 50 people in the room, and every representative of every jurisdictional agency, along with most of the landowners were there. And the, the topic had come up that the owners who had just purchased the Diamond A, they wanted to reintroduce natural fire, preferably natural fire and then introduce uh, prescribed fire. Everybody in the room realized it was a good idea. The secret was how do we mix all these goals and objectives from all these different entities? You had, at that time, New Mexico State Forestry was primarily focused on suppression. BLM was moving into, into managed, appropriate management response fires. Uh, the Coronado National Forest over on the Palencinos, they wanted to do appropriate management. We all knew that we needed to get there. The secret is how to do it. And we had to combine a lot, of, a lot of statutes and a lot of rules and a lot of regulations. And at that point, we weren't moving very fast. It was hard. There was, we were changing cultures and we were changing thought behaviors. So this is the first reiteration of the fire management plan for the for the New Mexico side of the Malpai Borderlands Group. Pretty rough, and but it worked. We, we made several copies of this. We were able to get this into people's hands, so they had that. So then by 90, 1997, when Sam Smith came along, we got started getting some technology and got more uh, cooperation with the BLM. And it was okay. Uh, it had a lot of verbiage. And instead of maps, it had a lot of tables and stuff like that for options for management. We just kept getting better and better, and Sam was a big part of that. This particular map shows all the different land ownerships and then their options for management, whether it's a consult with owner, contain and control, or suppress, it, suppress immediately. Then we really wanted to incorporate and integrate everything, so we were able to get a grant, and we came up with what's called the coffee table book. You can see we are able to use all this data from all these past fires and incorporate it. So, and then once we had those fire footprints on the, on the map, then we were able to look at 
fire effects, spread rates, and uh, vegetation condition and all that stuff, it was able to, we were able to actually give an idea of what the, where the fire was going to burn, how hot the fire was going to burn, and what kind of suppression resources. So this, this came out really nice, but the, the one problem was it was almost too big. So we had a contractor come and just basically paraphrase all this into this document. So every year, the Mount Pike Borderlands Group uh, produces this map. It's kind of the update version, and it allows people to look at it and see what the local, uh, what the local landowners, the local jurisdictional, everything, how they feel and what their process is for that, you know, what their what goals and objectives is for that year. The fire management areas are. We have predetermined boundaries and trigger points set within those fire management areas. Depending on where the fire is, the conditions, the current conditions of the fuel, of the, the weather and so forth, we're able to uh, manage the fire uh, properly. Things that would change that response would be uh, values at risk, somebody's home, somebody's corrals, maybe a rancher that has a pasture that he doesn't want burned or she doesn't want burned because uh, that's the only feed they have left until the monsoons or the, the growing season uh, starts. So it's very valuable to them. So that would be a suppress immediately type situation. And, and ultimately you've seen enough uh, fire behavior that you kind of have a gut feeling of what's going where it's going to go and where it's going to stop. And what's going to do. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because yeah, you're on the ground. Yeah, been doing it 25 years out here. So yeah. I know, I know things. Many years ago, that fire that we were doing and you called and oh you were doing the 209 a form we use to track fire actions and costs and everything we do that every day and i, I taught sam how to use it because there was no reason for anybody else to do it he was here he could fill out the 209 and he was submitting them and one day i got a call from uh, from our santa fe office and they said come on doug you mean to tell me you're managing a 15,000 acre fire in the boot hill with one guy <laughs> Doug asked me to put, please just put two in the number of people on the fire. <laughs> Even if I'm by myself, just put two, please. Yep, yep. Save him a lot of trouble. Yeah. So, that was the good old days. Yeah, we yeah. can't get that, get away with that anymore. Yep. This part of New Mexico is really unique. We got Chiricahua pine in the bottom. We got all kinds of oaks. We got all kinds of species up here. I mean, you got this massive mix of vegetation and not only vegetation but also wildlife i mean it's one of the most ecologically diverse areas in the state well guess what not only are the vegetation and the um, species the wildlife species diverse so are the landowners you know the, the national forest and the blm has to manage for multiple use a rancher wants to manage for cows there's some landowners farther up in the Pelencinos that basically turn their property into a into a preserve and they want to leave it just like it is. They don't want anything to happen on it. So the coordination that goes between getting all those different perspectives and different, different goals, and, goals and objectives is intense. I had a colleague that I used to work with for many years. We were doing all this collaborative meeting and stuff like that and we'd get buried in the 20% of stuff that we wanted to argue. But she would always push, let's, let's work on the 80% that we all agree on. If we focus on the 80% we all agree on, we can actually get something done and then work on that 20% a little bit here and there. Adobe fire, when before everybody else, you jumped on an ATV and went riding up the canyon and ran out of gas about a mile up the canyon. Here comes, where the hell did Doug go? Where's he? And then you come walking down the canyon with your helmet. Everybody go get some gas and get that damn four wheeler. <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah, I wanted to get up there and see what it looked like. First thing is before we to kind of come up with a plan for the day, and I didn't bother to check the gas tank. <laughs> that was the best. I got a kick out of that, Doug. Yep. I got to tell you. Well, Sam, it's been great to see you. Doug, take care of your feet. As always. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Anytime. Come yeah. on down. Yeah, I look at this floor. And it's kind of, this floor is a good uh, example of the, the collaboration and the cooperation that we've built over the years. We've got some stones that are a little oblong, a little kind of weird shape, maybe sharp pointed and stuff like that. And we've had people that are a little oblong and sharp and uh, short pointed and challenging. Yeah. And yeah. like each one of the stones is a different land agency or ranch and then the mortar is the people that hold it together. Yeah. And yeah, that's, that's a beautiful yeah. way to... Yeah. Look at it. Well, take care, brother. Yeah, take Good care. Good Have a safe trip back yeah. and uh, get back out here soon. 
Big landscapes require big dreams and big possibilities and big, big ideas. And that's what we were able to apply in the Boot Hill. Is we brought a lot of people into the show, the agency folks, the landowners, the just the, the cross-boundary cooperation and collaboration that we had to do to get this thing going. And I think we've made a good point. Other generations come in and move it forward and just uh, always treat this as one big landscape, not a combination of boundaries and different issues. Mm -hmm.